we saw it out. We didn't have the uh, we didn't have the savings and loans in those days. No, people didn't know those days when uh, uh, back there in 1914 before World War One, people didn't make enough wages to save. Working people never saved a dime. They didn't have the bank. So you must have, you two were fortunate enough then, you were, you were raising your family, mm -hmm. you had food on the table, you had a house, roof over your head, mm -hmm. you had a um, warm, mm -hmm. warm house in the wintertime, and you had a job all the time, and you were doing something mm -hmm. to raise the family. And you really, uh, you weren't, how can I say this, you were, you were all in bad shape, but you weren't as bad as no, some people that you know. No, no, no. <clears throat> Um, you, you and people are really in bad shape. That's right. Yes, there was. I'll tell you. Do you funny. have a neighbor or something that uh, that used to work here in town and lost his job during then and just had to move out or leave his family? To, do you remember Well, they lost their jobs, but they didn't leave their families. There was no place for them to go. Where did they get aid to stay in the houses they were living in and fuel to warm it? Clothes and food. Well, if you talk to me, I'll tell you something. A lot of people don't want to talk about that depression, and they're ashamed to true? tell. They're ashamed to tell what they went through. I'm not ashamed to tell that we lost lost a house and the difficulties we had. And if we'd had it worse, I wouldn't be ashamed to tell it. But people are ashamed to tell it. They want to make their heads up today and let people believe they always had it. Well, they didn't. Things were really that bad. They mm -hmm. sure were. And you, you couldn't pay your taxes. You couldn't. You know, and then when the banks got the, that property back, the, or the, whoever held the mortgages, they couldn't sell it. They, they then they couldn't eat it. They couldn't eat that farmland. You couldn't eat the. They couldn't eat those houses that they got back with mortgages. They couldn't pay. So you they couldn't help them any. They had the they had the the, 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 the land and the, and the buildings, but they couldn't they couldn't pay their bills with that either. So you people, did you have like? Well, you lived in like Morningside, you said. We lived in Greenville where the old car barns were around in that area. So they did you have like a milk cow or there. chickens or something like no, that out there? No, that day was passed. Mm -hmm. That day was passed. Years before that we did. Well, when he was a little boy, but then we When I was going to school, we had chickens and cows. Well, that day was but not everybody did. We saw that some people eat their houses that didn't have the money to. Wood. Wood? Yeah, it's going to chop down trees. Go out and cut down trees. But that eliminated a lot of trees in the Sioux City area in those 10 years then. Yes, it did. And I had. Uh, How much was the coal then? Uh, I bought coal at uh, $3 and, three and a half a ton for some and uh, anthracite coal at that time, there was no such thing as uh, as semi-anthracite because they didn't mind it, they didn't know how to do it. But uh, you, could, uh, you could get good coal for up as low well as $9 a ton. $9 a ton? Yes. Well, that's not bad. Yeah. You could get good, good coal. And, uh, when I was given a chance one winter that I could uh, work extra and earn enough to pay for my kid. It was brought on a contract, on a school contract. And uh, did extra work and pay for our kid that way. So, uh, but I was one of the lucky ones. I think I could I was able to work. But uh, a lot of people who had no trade, they had nothing that they could do. It was just uh, But they had trade, they couldn't do it. What could the plumbers do? They didn't build any building. What kept you and Charlie then here, here and then? Because you had the job, and you had the house, you had your mother mm -hmm. staying with you. So that's what kind of kept you here in this area then? Well, there was no place to go. That's no place to go. No, there was no part of the country that was any better until... Uh, Along about, 19, about 1938, when, uh, when World War, when they started over in Germany, well, then it began to pick up a little bit more work. We got more work into some city. Um, not, uh, not too much, but we did get some. And uh, then we gave, uh, 
because Big Harvey, when he gave Japan a lot of our old iron and steel. Now, what year was that in? In 37, 38, and 39. They were it, didn't they? No. They donated. They donated a lot of it. And then they threw it back in. Yeah, they threw it back in. So what did you think when you first heard about World War II then here? Well, uh, December, December 7th, 1941. What were you and Mary doing that day when you heard that on the radio? Uh, you I, was, I was up lying down, and uh, it was on a Sunday. And I said, do it. It was on Monday morning. Things were pretty hot around Sioux City. <coughs> Pretty hot in what way? Yeah, excitement. The poor Harvard had been bombed. Our son was over in Iowa, uh, uh, and Ames, going to college, and just said, gone in September, and this is in December, and the first thing he was at our door, he just dropped his books and came, and the boys just left the college and right and left to go into the service. Oh, they were drafted into the service? No, they, no, they volunteered. They, they told just, them because they were in our OTC that they would be the first yeah. ones drafted. Oh, because they were in a... They had our own TC in the colleges, and in the state colleges. And uh, they told him, they called them all together, and they told him, they said, well, you fellows will be some of the first ones drafted because we've had some training, and they need boys with training. Okay, so what did your boys do then? He quit school. Was he in the Army, Navy? Came home, and he joined the, the old Army Air Corps. They didn't have a little for them. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't have an so air force. Did he and they went from here down in uh, Texas. And they were just making it. Was it Shepherd? Shepherd Field. You know, they went down to Shepherd Field from here and they were just making it. And he said, uh, uh, I remember he wrote a poem. And he said, dude, we really have a change of diet down here. We never had the same thing for two meals. He said, uh, for dinner, you have the uh, beans and pork and sand. And then for supper, you have pork and beans and sand. That was a change of menu. That was the change of menu. So now, you and Mary, now what other kind of things? Today, right now, you look back on it all and you can reflect back on it. You raised your children, then in turn gave your grandchildren. Now you're you two set in the Senior Citizen Center. What are you two into? I know you're into a lot of things, but Charlie, she dragged you along to some of these things. First, I want to say, if I can, that you asked Charlie what he thought. I think we could be teetering on the fence for another big bust. Very thoughtful, and that's the way it oh, looks. Oh, I see. Like it. Yes, that's, that's what it looks to us. We don't think that this inflation and all this can keep. Well, you asked the question of the thousand-acre farms, thousand dollars an acre. Well, if the price of corn, I said two dollars. It's dollar sixty-five right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't raise enough corn on an acre of ground that you can pay a thousand dollars for an acre. Well, where's the money going to come from? Oh, okay, so yeah, sure. Okay, so now uh, we've only got about like another 10 minutes of tape here, but yeah. uh, what, what are you two into now? I mean, other kind of activities. I'll tell you how our life went, I can tell you. When we got married, I got married, but Charlie didn't. Well, I don't know. What are those deals? Well, he went out every day to work. I stayed home with the family. And he met everybody, and he did belong to one lodge that he used to go on Tuesday night, but I stopped going up. Then now the children are raised, but he has his things he belongs to, really. They're all male, uh, really. Uh, he belongs to KC's. Yeah, KC's, and he belongs to the, to the Engineers Club and, and all those kind of things, you know. And I was just left behind. Well, now I can go but he is established and he likes his things and I like mine. So we still go uh, each other's ways. Uh, yes, and it was me that wanted to come here and do a lot of the things we do. And the elder has to let the Charlie goes with me. He's very good and he always takes me any place I want to go. But I don't think if it was for me that he would go, go to these these things because his, his interests are different than mine. So how long have you been with some of these lodges here in Sioux City then, Charlie? Well, I'm uh, 
I think I got a 30 year membership with the Knights of Columbus. Over in South Sioux? No. Kansas City, too? Well, we never had anything to do with South Sioux. And uh, I quit the Engineers Club because I uh, wear too many complexions. And uh, they got a little bit out of line. Well, I'll tell you, Charlie, when you need on the Rottenbush, when the prices go up on the, on the luncheons when you belong to an organization and you're on Social Security, you can't go for all those high price things. You can if you want to, but you, you try to watch your, uh, your savings a little bit so the nursing homes can get it off. <laughs> so you two, you're not a nursing home right now. You oh, are? No, no. We, we, we stay by ourselves and we don't keep house like we used to, but we have not alone. We just can't. So you're going every day then? We go. Every day, every every day. I mean, like right now, what are you yeah. Charlie into? Every day, you're always going places. Well, and we're here today. Tomorrow, we'll go to the library and play cards. We have an evening club, and, and every five weeks, it's my turn to entertain or our turn. So you know what we do? We just clean the house every five weeks and wipe up the bathroom floor, and the rest of the time we don't do nothing until the next five weeks. And then we clean the house. So you're always, people are always doing something here. Of course, I am even through the summer. I'm Nobody home any house. I have a big yard that takes a lot of time. Now you still live in the in the same house that you did. We've been in the house for 46 years. Same spot. There's one thing I want to tell you, and I hope it goes on this tape. What's going on now? I want to give advice to young people. Get your home paid for before you retire. People who don't have their homes paid for and in good condition when they retire are really up state quick because they cannot, on their Social Security and their pensions, make those house payments and those taxes and all that. They are, the, and those people who rent, who never bought a home, and they have to do up that rent every month. So I will give that advice to young people. Get your home paid for, no matter how humble a home or what, but get your home paid for. That's a priority. Never mind, never mind the boats and the campers, because when you get older, you're, you're going to have problems. So you, try, you travel around now? You go to other states and go see your... Yes, we did, because the children are all over. We got so many from coast to coast. Do you travel around now and go visit them? No, uh, not for the last year. We put them on trips because it's kind of difficult for us to, to drive. We don't, we, when we Up go until we, two years ago, we tried to. Mm -hmm. We've been east one year and west the next year. We got one well, seven children, you ought to be able to... Six, 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 yeah, six, six yeah, we lost one ground in the last week. He was in the army and he drowned up there on a weekend. He thought he was interested in geology. And then we had... Uh, and then there's one in Sacramento, California, one's in Bakersfield, and, and one's in near Providence, Rhode Island, one's near Boston, and one's in Denver, and one's in Marietta, Ohio. And they're all doing very, very, very well. Now, I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you when they left Sioux City, and they were, our, we had our children during the bad times, but when everything opened up, they were at an age to go into work, working fields. So that was good, then. And we only had one who went to college before, and then he got married, and he, but he had four children, I think, when he graduated, but he kept on going on working and going. And, uh, yes, yeah, so they're, they're all doing very, very well. And they all go to school since they're married and keep it going. But uh, they didn't get no education from us past high school. Uh, did you go, go, go through high school then? Well, I tried had three years and I didn't have any. That's the reason I go to elder hostel and all those things to learn a little something now. How does that help you? Very well, very well. What did you think of that deal with Briar Cliff this summer? You only got in on the night session, so no, you got in on some day session. Well, I played hooky one time on Thursday afternoon and went over. I didn't there doodly squat for that other thing that I signed up for. Which one was that now? Oh, uh, that was the Elder Hostel over there. It was nice, but it was not my cup of tea. It was poetry, Phil Hay and poetry. And uh, I don't mind writing up compositions and things, but not the kind of stuff that they had. And then it was public speaking, which uh, I, I didn't go too much for that either because uh, and well, how was the other people? How did they look at that? They uh, liked it. They, that all English, liked they liked that English up there? Yes, with they all liked it. They all enjoyed it. I guess I was the only, only one. So then when I found out that was, I just stumbled onto that other thing. That's how I went out. Huh? Uh, no, that's pretty quick. But I kind of like to ask questions, uh, okay. kind of personal question. How old are you and Charlie right now? I'm 76. Charlie's 78. And we have good health. Sure we're, so, like we're, we're, we're slowed up. We can't. We can't do all. You know, hurry and, and get. Uh, you know, and 
but we take our time. We, take, we, we try to get some enjoyment out of life now because it's short now. <laughs> short. A lot of years. I might be in a nursing home tomorrow with a broken hip. And I have all these things to think about. So you've seen some of the bad times, and now you're looking at some of the good times. That's right. Trying to catch up. You, well, trying to catch up, but you can respect life now. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Did you ever think there's ever going to be an end to that depression? No, it didn't look like it. You know, of course, uh, then we had the good times from 1941 until 45. That yes. was the good times during yeah, the war? Was it good yes. times? Work was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yes, but they froze the wages and you didn't make much wages. They, uh, they froze the wages and froze people on the jobs because they were always going where they make a little more money. Oh, I see. Work, see? Mm -hmm. So then the, uh, the government froze you where you were and froze the salaries. But that's when people started making money again was in their World War II. After the war was After over. the war was over. After the war was over. Then things began to pick up in all, in all lines. So especially, of course, in the building lines because houses were scarce. You couldn't build during the years. Schools were scarce. Schools were scarce. Churches were scarce and those roofs were taken up on places. Everything. You should see, in our neighborhood, when we were brought up, there's some houses there, a lot of them, and people were just no screens on them, and they were in such poor condition and no paint, and I thought, well, those old shacks, you know. Of course, ours wasn't like that, but then there were many of them, they were rented, you know. But you know that after the war, and I went back down there, and people got to work, and you'd be amazed how they fixed up those houses. At Brightener Houses again, and started putting money yeah, back in. Yeah, the old houses, and they screened down the porches, and painted them, and fixed them, and worked. <laughs> Nineteen This is a talk that I'm going to give at the Senior Center to the Senior Aides, July 19th. The subject is ourselves. I don't know a subject that is more interesting than ourselves to ourselves. So let's talk a little bit about ourselves. Life has a number of cycles we must live through. First, infancy. Second, childhood. Third, adolescence. Fourth, adulthood. Fifth, middle age. Sixth, the young elderly. Seventh, the middle aged elderly. Eighth, senior or older elderly. We must accept ourselves as we are and learn to live with ourselves. But if we have faults, we must try to correct them. There are no angels on this earth. We must accept criticism that is just and do something about it. Don't try to be somebody else. Never mind the Joneses. Maybe the Joneses would be happier if they came down to your level. Jesus lived a simple life, and what was good enough for him is good enough for me. You, you know how much sleep and rest you need. Eat a well-balanced meal, protein, starches, sweets, sugar, calcium, and fruits. As our children go on their own and our working days are over, we must not just sit in that old rocking chair and watch TV. We must set a time each day for exercise, whatever you choose and how much you can take. At my age of 78, I walk At my age of 78, I walk. I like to take my walk each day between 6 and 7 a.m. in summer and when it is daylight. In winter I go later but always the same time each day. If you don't have a set time, many days you just don't walk. I walk 14 blocks each day. In winter I dress warm and still walk but not 
when it is icy or the walks are covered with snow. You know we are what I call the b broken bone age. The mind also needs exercise to keep alert. Reading is very good. Read something that you learn something from. But a good story is also very relaxing and enjoyable. Socialize. Go where there are people. Make many friends. New friends to add to old friends. Each person brings something new into your life. And they need you too. TV also has some programs that we can learn from as well as the entertainment programs. Choose a happy, choose a hobby or a special interest, something you enjoy, whatever it may be. Do things on your own. You don't always need a lady friend along. Go to a movie alone or a symphony or a ballet or whatever. I think women, more so than men, hesitate to do something alone. I like to go to the city council meetings and many special meetings, like the meetings the Charter Commission held in the various parts of the city, or the school board meetings on closing the schools and so forth. Perhaps we can't accomplish as much in a day as we used to, but in all things we can do the best we can. And I find when we are retired, we have the time to help each other. The younger folks are busy working and have family responsibilities. We can take each other shopping if we drive or sit with a sick husband or wife so the other one can get out to take care of business or enjoy an afternoon. I'm getting a little forgetful, so I write notes to myself. If I want to telephone someone tomorrow, I just, I put the telephone book on the floor where I'll see it tomorrow. Out of sight, out of mind. So whatever you want to remember, put something where you will see it. I myself take one day at a time, more or less, and trust in the good Lord. As I have one birthday after another and slow up, I just say, Mary, keep crawling. And don't forget to enjoy Mother Nature. Look at the trees, the sky, the sunrise and sunset, the rivers, hills, flowers, and all the other things. Many never have seen them. When I walk, that is one of the times I commune with myself. That is the 30 minutes in the day I am alone and I plan my day and think of the joys and sorrows in my life the regrets and about the mistakes I made, and also what I have accomplished. I have learned to forgive myself and make my peace with God. After all, I don't think any of, of us really deliberately make mistakes or do some unkindness to a fellow man. We are all just everyday human beings. Oh, and forgive your neighbor also. Peace of mind is very essential to us all. Remember, into each life some rain must fall. So take care of yourselves physically and mentally. Love yourself and others. Never carry a grudge or bitterness. That can damage your health and make you very unhappy. Join a group that works for a better world. Now I know you have figured out all these things I have told you about long ago, but I thought it was good to review them.
Oh, it's just, it's just, no, just right go ahead, just give your name. It's, uh, who oh. do you want to talk to? Oh. I'm Mary Norris, Sioux City, Iowa. Go ahead. And uh, this is my husband, Charles Norris. And we've lived in Sioux City a good many years. And uh, the way I understand, you would uh, like to have a discussion about uh, the Depression years, the years before and the years after the Depression. Now, as I remember it, um, the, uh, everything was pretty stable in, before World War I. But after, uh, and during War, World War I, all the prices went up, the farm commodities and everything, and ev uh, they borrowed and everybody, everything went good. After the war, World War I, and they didn't need to ship so much grain and supplies, metals of all kinds, to uh, war machines to Europe, then things sloughed up. But when 1929 came along, the stock market crashed. And many banks had been closing up to that time, but when that happened, that really took the steam out of everything. And then, in, in, uh, see, the farmers had borrowed so much, and the grain prices went down, corn went down to 10 cents a bushel, and they uh, couldn't pay back their loans, so that was bad for the banks, even if they took their farms, they couldn't sell them again. So after the 1929 crash, things really got bad. Uh, and President Roosevelt was elected in 1932. He declared a banking holiday. Immediately he took office and put in a lot of new programs. Well, what was and a banking holiday? The, the banking <laughs> holiday was he closed all the banks in the nation. I think it was for three days. And then he established, uh, what is it, I believe the Federal Reserve or some something to protect the banks, insurance or something to protect the banking. And of course, anybody that had money in the bank, uh, they didn't get it back for a long time and then they only got a percentage and some people had to take uh, stock in the banks. And, and um, we have, Charlie's mother happened to have some, so we kept it. For all these years, from the, the, that year till just about three, four years ago, and then uh, we sold it and made real good on it. But some people had to sacrifice theirs for less. Well, then uh, he established the CC camps, which were. Um, now, what was the CC camp? Was that here in Sioux City? Yes, yes. Well, what were you doing uh, all the way up to the CC camp? What was that? Turn it off. Well, the CC camp was for anybody that was in service in World War I. It was a civilian, it was a civilian deal. Civilian but, Conservation Corps. But you had to have a military discharge to get into it. Okay, so if you had a military discharge... And then, you, then you could join the CC mm -hmm. group, and uh, they paid them a small salary. Not very much. I don't remember just what the salary was. And in fact, I don't think I ever heard. But you got bored and room. That was here in Sioux City. That was here, well, in the surrounding yes, territory. Mm -hmm. Because they took uh, and did a lot of work in Stone Park at that time. And they had a regular camp set up out there for them, right in Stone Park. Then they uh, went around to some of these other small towns and set up these camps. And the boys lived the same as they did when they were in service, in a tent. But, uh, Unemployment was terrible. There uh, was just no work. That's all there was to it. There was nothing to do. People would walk on the streets. We had soup lines right here in Sioux City. Do you remember? Oh, yes, I remember because I was, uh, I was working in the woodwork industry. And we had no business. And we were, everybody was working short hours. If you got uh, if you got thirty hours a week, you were lucky. So how much was that an hour then? Well, I would say uh, the uh, the minimum wage, as I remember, was twenty five cents an hour. 
and there wasn't anybody paying any more than they had to. Mm -hmm. So, uh, now how old were you then, during this time? Well, and, uh, I'm a year ahead of the calendar. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the big slump hit us in 1921 after World War One ended in 1918. So, of course, I was 42 at that time. It, uh, it was rough. The savings uh, selling three dozen per quarter, but uh, it was like if you had the quarter to buy the three dozen, so I bought one dozen at 10 cents. So you and Mary were married then during the divorce? We were married in 22. Mm -hmm. And uh, from 22 to, uh, to 33, there never was any big rush of anything. There was a little, a little pickup around about 24, 25, but it didn't amount to too much. And then after that, then we had the second slump. And we were very sad in 29 when, uh, when the stock market really blew up. That was the, the blow that killed the invasion of the United States. So who would you think would be to blame then for the Depression? If you, if well, you had to put your finger on it back then, who were they blaming for the Depression? Of course, our, our president got the blame, even though he tried his best. The president to was who then? Hoover. Hoover at the time? That's right. Uh, Hoover came out when, uh, in 1924, 1928, when he was elected, uh, he came up with his slogan was a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. Well, it didn't work out that way for the poor man, you know? and he got the blame of the of the stock market crash. And of course, they had to blame it on to somebody, but the whole blame actually was uh, World War One. That's what caused the crash, because everything, everything was war work and war products, and when the war was over, well, there was just nothing, nothing They had to borrowed too much. Everybody was in debt to the bank. Everybody was in debt. Okay, I have a question to kind of ask both of you. So during the critical period, do you feel that the family ties were stronger? Now you and, and your husband's name is what again now? Charlie. Charlie, you were married then. Do you feel that family ties were stronger back there in this time? Uh, yes, I do. Yes. You had children during this time? Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. You had your <laughs> own place to live in here? Uh, well, I'll house, tell you. Every, just kind of tell me something about that. During it. those years, there was a lot of empty houses, and, and the working people, people could not buy homes. And if, if you married, and first thing you know, your little husband was out of work, you moved in with your parents, mm -hmm. his or hers. And sometimes it was the older parents that moved in with the uh, married child. So what was in your case, Sam? We moved in with Charlie's people. He was an only child, and mm -hmm. my people had a family. And so we moved in with his people. And um, so then that was another thing that Roosevelt, uh, was it Roosevelt started the FHA? Yes. Was a, the FHA was Federal Housing administration and we had bought a little home too during this time i went to work at the department store and saved my nine block home we lost it but anyhow um then this uh, federal housing administration was established and then you could borrow from the bank they would take your mortgage but they, it was it was insured by the government if you uh, missed your payments or defaulted, the banks was protected by the, the government insurance. So how long did you live with uh, Charlie's parents? Then? Well, 15 years. You lived 15 years mm -hmm. with his parents till you were able to get things kind of put back well, together? Well, we tried one time to go out by ourselves, and, and like I say, I had gone to work and saved my money when the first baby was a year old. I worked a year and saved all that I made, and we bought a hot little house. We moved in it and I lived with there very long. There was the, the men didn't get any hours in for work and they didn't get any wages. 
so then we moved back with them, and then we rented a little house, and then later on we tried it again, we moved in our own little house, and we couldn't make it, so then we moved back with Charlie's people, and then, um, uh, uh, then we tried it again, we went back in our own little house, and then we weren't there very long, and Charlie's father passed away by an accident, and then uh, his mother came to live with us. Well, the little house was too small, so she mortgaged her little home that she had and paid down on a bigger house. And when her money ran out, that FHA just came in. So then we could we took that over. Otherwise, I always say we'd be living on the riverbank because we was having our children, you know, just right along. Anyway, that never stops you. <laughs> and, um, <coughs> And uh, so that's, and we weren't the only ones. That's the way everybody's family life was. So there was some, well, how can I replace this? Uh, it's like you, you say it back where nobody was buying anything. Like you were working in the furniture, um, making furniture, so and so forth. Oh, well, there was, was, the, there was a millwork business. In the millwork which business? Which is houses mm -hmm. and buildings. And there was none being built then? No, there was nothing being built. There was no money to to do anything. Remember so what did you do during this time then? You see, I, well, I, uh, I had one winter, business was pretty, pretty bad, so I went to, I was young enough, and I got permission from the management that I could take off, and that would give somebody, another man working in the woodwork, and I went to, to the packing house as a steam cleaner. Here in Sioux City? Here in what was the name of that packing house? Armour and Company. The old armor building over here. That's right. And they steam fitted on the steam fitting crew all winter. Then in the spring, I, I was called back, of course, when the business picked up a little bit. But uh, you only made 32 hours a week. At 25 cents an hour? No, I that think. I think they had raised it at that time. I don't remember just what it was. But, you, but, but your family was able to keep things together and food on the table. Between the two oh, families, we did. They provided the home, people provided the home, and we provided the groceries. Mm -hmm. So, so we, what you saw in the did. streets during the day in Sioux City at nights was, was there a lot of action going on all the time? A lot of. Well, I almost must, but I would like to tell you about this, too. I don't think Charlie told you, if you don't mind. We had the, 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 all these different things Roosevelt established, you know, the WPA. Mm -hmm. And the PWA. Yeah, and the WPA. Now, that did, did Charlie talk about that? No. We, well, uh, the, uh, let's see, where's my slip? That come later. See, we were up to 29. But we come for Social Security. Oh, Social, Social Security. Security. Social Security came in 1948. 30, yeah, right. 36. 35. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's when it was enacted, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the WPA and the PWA, did you know yeah, anybody that WP, belonged to that? Or? The WPA was Public Works Administration, and that was Public Works. They built public buildings. Our mm -hmm. auditorium was built with that, and also the athletic field. And the, and the uh, WPA was um, worked project administration and they get smaller jobs like road work and here in Sioux City. Yes. Uh -huh. How do people get on that? that? National You had to be on relief. You had to be on relief. And where did you work out of? Was there a place here in Sioux City where they had to go report to? Oh yes. It was run it was run by the city officials. Mm -hmm. So the WPA you reported to the uh, to the street department. That's who control of that. And, uh, and they, they would take you out, take a bunch of men out in a, in a truck, and you'd work all day, so many days a week. You couldn't even work every week, every day. You had to take your turn. Mm -hmm. So as to give more people a chance to get in. This is on the WPA program. On the WPA. Charlie, did they get some uh, some like food stamps then? We had food stamps during the war, but during the depression, uh, was there some uh, substitute there subsidizing in food or something there? There was something. You see, they had surplus foods after after the war. I don't know whether it was on account of the war that they had the government had overbought or whether it was trying to bring up the farm prices, and they had 
It's all this surplus food, and that's what they doled out then, lard and, and pork and whatever they had, you know, flour, and, and during those years. So where did that take place out here in Sioux City? Mm -hmm. We never got on that. Is it a courthouse, or where did that take place? Well, they had a, they had a building it seems to me it was across the street from the courthouse. We called it the old telephone building. And I think that was where they headquartered the relief department. Mm -hmm. Now, where, where did people stay at that needed relief? That overnight people, families, and so forth, that couldn't, uh, that were in transit? Well, the only place they had at that time to stay was the, uh, was the uh, old administration and the Salvation Army. I bet you it was filled. I imagine it was. Uh, because I'll tell you, uh, it just was rough. You couldn't, you couldn't buy anything and you couldn't sell anything. It just and, was no money. Yes, and when, the, when the, uh, people, I heard somebody say not long ago, well, I, I'm afraid there's going to be a, a recession. I'm going to put all my money in land. And we said to her, well, if you pay a thousand dollars an acre for land today, but if there comes a depression, it won't be worth a hundred dollars, and you can't even sell it. There's nobody to buy it. And see, people don't realize that. That's just when like Social Security came into being. You got the first one in this area, then? Well, uh, they came right over to the shop. This is the original Social That's Security card right here. The original Social Security card. You realize how old this is? Yes, 1936. December 1936. They went around to the, to the place of businesses and, and registered the man right right there. We didn't have to go out at all. They came out and they found came, you. They came out and we registered us and issued our, our cards. But what did you think about the Social Security when uh, Roosevelt well, first came out? Well, of this? course, at that time, when it was explained to you, what did you, how did you feel about it? Well, of course, everybody was in favor of it. We had to go on with it. We didn't have any choice. But well, how was it expressed to you? Was it a good thing or was it a bad thing? Oh, or? Yeah, it, was, uh, it was a good thing. You know, at a time like that, you accept anything that they're going to help, help you or help the nation people. Then in, after Roosevelt was elected and sworn in as president of the United States, of course, that took place as, as of January. 1933. Then he declared this moratorium of closing all the banks and any of the banks that were not able to satisfy the United States government that they could reopen, never reopened. And any of them that could satisfy that they had enough money to reopen, could reopen. And then they gave them the privilege, like Mary said, of a certain amount of your money, you would get 80% of what you had on deposit. And then, if you had more than that, you had to take a certain percentage, I believe it was 20%, in stock, in shares in the bank. Mm -hmm. And of course your shares, you were paying a premium for your shares. Your share was listed at $10. But you paid thirteen dollars and forty cents per share. Well, that kind of took care of the twenty percent, didn't it? Yeah, but we held ours. We had fourteen shares, didn't we, Charlie? I had fourteen and original they, shares. They divided it then. That was in the later years, now not too many years ago. And you got then you had twenty-eight shares. Yes, I got two for one. And then, uh, see, the first national bank was who we were banking with. And in fact, I had banked the First National Bank from the time that I was five years old. I'd have an account in the First National Bank. Is that bank still in its original place then? Yes. And uh, then when the uh, business got better and the first took over the Woodbury County Savings Bank, then they split the shares. And uh, you got two, two for one. So we were lucky enough that we were able to hold on to our shares. A lot of people had to sell their shares. And I remember I got a telephone call one day, and it was one of the uh, stock and loan 
Come and share in time. He said, I understand you have some shares in the First National Bank. I said, yes. Well, he said, would you like to sell them? I said, well, what are you offering? Well, he said, I don't know if you're far, which is $10. And I said, they cost me for over $13. Why should I sell them to you for $10? Well, let me go ahead and tell them about how it wound up in this much detail. So then uh, you know, he got a lot of shares that way mm -hmm. because people needed the money. Mm -hmm. So ten dollars was ten dollars. So they sold them. Well, then any of us that held on to the shares later on, of course, they got to be part of that and then they began paying dividend. So uh, did you sell them shares that cost you thirteen dollars for? And when you just sold them recently, you said. Yeah, $80 a share. We got $80 a share. Yeah, $80 a share. Many, uh, uh, Minneapolis uh, money came down our bank or something and, and uh, bought them all up. And they said that would be our last chance to, and so we bought. by holding them, we really made on them. What did you folks kind of do then for recreation or Christmases and holidays down that time? Can you kind of remember some of that? Because you, you were raising a family then. That's right. And uh, his mother had moved down. Uh, what were you doing then for recreation or Christmas? You didn't do any recreation, you only work. You picked well, up every other job that you could pick up. And, uh, yes, but for Christmas time, the families got together somehow, you know, and uh, I'd go to the dime store and buy little dime store dishes and things for the children. And uh, then we have the family dinner. Yeah. But there was no bowling and no golfing and no, no, very few could go to college or anything like that. We didn't have a car. We went to the grocery store with a poster wagon. And everybody was satisfied. We were more, uh, not all this excitement all the time. Well, when you first felt the impact of the Depression then, when was it? How did you feel about it? When you first knew it was finally here? They talked about it and all of a sudden you knew it was here. Well, I tell you, the Depression was here, uh, 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 a good part of it, and a good it was pretty bad in 1921 because Charlie and I were going together and we went together three years we couldn't afford to get married. And then uh, after we did uh, get married, well, we had a very difficult time and then of course within a year we had a child and so then that's when we had to move in with his people. We didn't have health insurance. There was a uh, hospital bill, a doctor bill and children were sick and there was, uh, there was no health insurance. Who helped take care of all the, uh, this sickness and uh in the childbirth and stuff. Did you go to the hospital well, then, or did they mm -hmm. have Yes, yes, but we could do it, but we went, I had one dress, and I wore that until it fell off of me, until it was, uh, just went to pieces right on my body for a good, you know, and uh, we made things, uh, clothes out of, uh, for the children out, out of flower sacks, and uh, there was, people made curtains, they made everything out of flower sacks, unbleached muslin was cheap at that time, and it meant everything. But, but you know that people went to bed hungry. I, uh, I have a sister who didn't have any food in the house for three days, and my mother didn't know it, but I, he, her husband would not go down and ask for anything. And there were many people who went to bed hungry. And, and then I had another sister who was alone with her children, and she had to put them to bed. She lived in a real cheap house, too, and I had to put them to bed while she went for the WPA to give her a little job at the Boys and Girls Home. But her children, she kept out of school and put their snowsuits on them and put them in bed because she didn't have any fuel to keep the house warm. And left those children, little bit of children, they're all alone. Uh, I'll tell you, it was rough. So did you have very really close friends that just couldn't take it? I mean, you just uh, yes, no, just no. said, I'm, I'm through, I can't take it. What did they do? Well, and not so much, I don't think, among the, 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 the ordinary people, but I'll tell you, there was many a businessman when that 29 crash came that jumped out the windows in the hotels in the big office building. Right here in Sioux City. Well, I don't remember any here in Sioux City, but in New York. I suppose you wanted a Sioux City story, but in New York, there was yeah. one man who did, did jump out the window. I don't want to mention any name from Sioux City, and it was rumored that he did that to save his business here downtown, but I couldn't verify that, but that was the story. And, uh, but he did jump out of, not here in Sioux City, he jumped, he was a Sioux City businessman, but he jumped in uh, New York. So where did you and Charlie live then? How far from downtown? Well, we always pretty much lived in, in the Morningside and Greenville area. So you're kind of out of the way from the 
everyday traffic then, weren't you? Oh, yes. Because old high, the Highway 20 was just a mud road back then. Or was it cement road? Uh, I believe they had cement there, but there were very few streets in the, in the, uh, in the residential residential Oh, and dirt. Well, how many people then that came out to your place were asking for handouts, like hobos tram in transit and stuff? Too. You never, you didn't get that much traffic no, out there? No. Not until we moved where we are now, then there was a few came, because where we are now, uh, the uh, railroad is old down about uh, 10, 11, 12 blocks, and they used to get off of the freight there when they were coming into the city or wanting to go out, and then they Did you have any that. friends that <clears throat> that they come to their house and ask them for stuff then? Yeah, they, uh, they prayed more in those days. They prayed more to the churches. So when they hit a town, that's the first place they go to get a meal is through the church, the soup lines. Yeah. It was, uh, that seemed to be where they were having better luck. And of course, that, that was passed along. So we're talking 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, and 34, you, 35. We're talking seven years. Yes. And you ask, during hard times. You ask what people did about these bills. People didn't pay their dentist bill. They didn't pay their doctor bill. You didn't go unless you positively had to. But those bills never got paid. And those poor fellows, sometimes they had to take it from the farm or they took meat or or some city man probably went and did a little work around their house for them. There was no money. They, they uh, uh, got paid some time in services and in, in, in whatever products you were uh, a farmer raised. But the, the doctors and uh, dentists, and that, they really suffered. So did you have any farmer was, friends during this time then that just lost it? Yes. You know, just uh, good farmer friends. You probably had some, didn't you, Charlie? Yes. That had land and had things going good until this all mm -hmm. came about. You want to tell me about When they lost their farm, and it's, what? that was the whole story. They just uh, they just couldn't meet the payments. And well, how much was grain kind of selling for? Do you get any idea? Um, <clears throat> corn went down to 10, corn cents, went down to 10 cents a bushel. And many farmers burned it instead of buying coal rather than sell it at that price. The only rates out of the furnace doing it, if they had a furnace. Well, you did. You say you did have farmer friends that, that yeah. did lose it then? Well, they, they did lose their farm, yes. Who did they lose the farm to? Hmm? Who did they lose the farms to? To the banks. The banks? Yes. If they had borrowed a loan to buy stock, well, the stock didn't bring anything, didn't bring what it cost them to buy it. So, naturally, they couldn't pay their loan. And the bank then would foreclose. Oh, sometimes the bank would give them another extension of another year. Well, next hey, year was even better. So how was the crops then? Was it good crops in years? Was the crops really uh, poor? The crops were fair, of course, not in comparison of today, because there was not the fertilizer used in those days. Uh, there was no such thing as commercial fertilizer. And we had the drought. And uh, then we had the drought. What years was that? Uh, 30, 34. Well, we had a drought in, in, the, 20, in the 20s, too. And, uh, then we had uh, the second drought, and then we had the, uh, the, the dust. The dust storm was in the 30s, wasn't it? Well, John was born in 1934, yeah. um, and that was one of the years. That was one of the years. Did you get your seed back in the garden? Did you have a big garden? Yes, we had two, two, two big lots, but uh, we had a few tomato plants and what have you, and carried water across the street for, to get them started. But you didn't even get your seed back. That well, was another thing that the government did. If you were going to have your own garden, you could go down to the courthouse and they would give you seeds to plant a garden. That was federal. Uh, you could get seeds free of charge to plant your garden. Yes, but then the growth hit and <laughs> your seeds didn't go in the garden. Well, people can those days when they did get anything and they did their own sowing. And they uh, they got along without a lot of things, just an awful lot of things. Just an awful lot. You just got along without. But you, Charlie, did you have a car back then? Did you have an automobile? No. No, we didn't. Walking wasn't crowded, was it? No. We didn't think anything of walking. It's a lot, a lot of horse and buggy still up and down the main streets of the city then? There was some. Not too many. Not too many. 
that was already passed that day. Okay, well, there were still teams being used on grading and such as that. It was, uh, it was after the World War II that the machinery really came into use to any extent in the uh, in the great end of the street work. Before that, it was done by teams with slips and rollers and shovels. You didn't have foot rollers and all that. You had to Say then that the uh, people working WPA then Charlie were making a dollar an hour? I think they got up to a dollar an hour. Now, what year was that in? Uh, well, it would have to be in all about in 34 because it was after uh, uh, in 34 to 36 along in there because it was Roosevelt's term that he started that uh, WPA and PWA and, and then, they, uh, then they gave grants to the city to different cities, the public grants. Uh, the Weber Sioux City had a grant from the federal government to build three schools. And there was three schools. Contracts for three schools was let at the same time. And of course, being in the Woodwork industry, that was right in our, up in our alley. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was two Woodwork plants in Sioux City at the time. And the one I was with, we got two of the schools, and the other one got one. So that gave us some work. And, uh, yes, and the children went to Kathy School, and Charlie used to go over and work for the church to pay the tuition, he and a lot of other fathers. Well, you had to have some good times. <clears throat> uh, some people did. But, uh, I mean some good times, some good times you can remember, not... <clears throat> People got together and enjoyed themselves, you mean? Mm-hmm. Even with your family, you had to have good times. Times of laugh and kind of, and just kind of let the mm -hmm. depression go, go away for no, a while. No, Charlie mm -hmm. and I didn't. But I tell you, we were family raising people, and we didn't have a car. And But I, there were people who used to get together, and they'll tell us today that they, they were all in, in a bad way, you know, financially, but one of them mix to get in there to have a uh, crop of beans or something, they'd get together and and play cards and, and uh, do things. But you know, we didn't. We didn't. We stayed pretty much to raise our own family and, and well, just the family. I tell you, when you, live, when you are a young couple and you live with an older couple, Charlie's father was 50 years old when he came along and he was the only child. And you come, he grew up and come in there with little babies. You're not going to run around evenings and socialize around and leave your old uh, mother and father babysit with your children at, the, at that age. And uh, Charlie's father was still working. He worked till he was he was 80 when he was hit by a car and worked for the service company, streetcar company. Yeah, you know. city. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he was hit by a car. At the week, uh, week till he was 80 uh, years old. Yeah. When he was killed. Yeah, he was. He used to. Uh, of course, he was an old man. He he had different positions in his life, you know, responsible positions. But this, when he was an old man, he was uh, greasing the, the the rails where the streetcars go around in the summer. So now, where was, was this at? It's it's a city. city. Yeah, but where was it located at? Where they did the turnaround? Where was the turnaround? It wasn't a turnaround. It was just when they went from Fourth Street up Court Street or up Jennings Street, or, and then in the winter time. Yeah, on the hills, he'd sand the tracks to keep the streetcars from flipping. Well, then it was in the 17th day of September. We had had a little dawn on the 16th, and he, he had said one time, I'll never see it for my grandchildren because he was old with hurricane. But he lived to see four. And of course, it was born the day before he was hit the car. It was early in the morning in winter, you know, December. So, how many children did you raise him? Seven. Seven children? That's a large family. Yeah. It was Catholic. <laughs> Some people, you know, adjust the things to their, you know. 
question. What else did you have on your list that you thought would be important for this? Well, I think that's about it here. And um, I think we I think we covered uh, quite a bit quite a bit of it. I went on to to tell you just one of the depression, didn't you? So when did you and Mary get married then? What 1922. Year? 1922. Mm -hmm. What did you do that day? Do you remember that day? Yes. What did you do that day? Well, neighbor baked a wedding cake. We was married St. Louis first. The neighbor baked a wedding cake. We didn't even invite any guests to the wedding, just the family. We didn't take no wedding trip. I just had a suit. I'd buy something that I could wear afterward. You didn't have no white wedding those days. And if you will notice in the obituary, a lot of those people that were married in those days, they are married in El Point or Dakota City. You see, they could go over there for their $2 or what have you and get married. There was no wedding. You couldn't afford a wedding. Yeah, it was, they didn't get here. They, they did not get married in Sioux City. No, no they go over there to get married. I, I don't know why, because they did, they, did, they couldn't afford a wedding. They couldn't afford the clothes. They couldn't afford the reception. They couldn't afford. No, they couldn't afford so, a wedding. In well, Sioux City, you had to take out a license and uh, you know, uh, 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 you could go over to either Dakota City or El Point, and uh, there was no questions asked. So where did you and Charlie get married at then? Right right in Sioux City. You got married in Sioux City. Right, right in, in Sioux City. My family and Charlie's family go breakfast to know. And we, we did have some wedding pictures taken. But just nothing like what they have today. We just had a picture. Charlie and a picture of me alone, not even together. And just enough for my brothers and sisters and his people, you know. We didn't have no books. You just couldn't afford those things. You had to get married in a dress that you could wear for 10 years. <laughs> so Charlie, tell me about some of them, like you talked about the bread lines, the soup lines. Well, Was that going on constantly then? Oh, yes, every day. Where do people sleep? On the streets? Well, we couldn't sleep on the streets in the winter because our winds are too severe around here. But uh, we had what they used to call the Helping Hand Mission. They had a building down on 4th Street. And they, uh, they used to take them in and they had 10 cents that paid for their bed and breakfast. No, the what street was that on? I don't down on 4th Street. Between, uh, between Virginia and Jennings, I believe it was. On the north side, sir? No, it was on the south side of the street. And they had a, they had a building down there. And of course, if you stayed there, you had to clean up the next morning. You had to make your bed and put on the clean bedrooms and such as that. Isn't that the time they so, had good water chicken mash between yes, those pots? You know, because yes. some would steal from the other if there was anything in it, you know. In this, in this place, they would steal from each other? Oh, yes. Oh, sure. Yes. A, lot sure. Fights, a lot of fights, a lot of... No. Lots, wouldn't have any How many bars there. were open here in Sioux City? Was there a lot of bars mm -hmm. open? There was a few, yes. Were there any gangsters in this town or no, any no. mafia or anything like that? Or no, in the we street? Did have, we did have, we did have a, a rough crew down in the, what they call the South Bottoms around the stockyards there. What do you mean by rough crew? Well, they, what we, Sioux City would call rough, they gambled and they, there was a couple of some murders down there too, you know. And uh, you see, uh, uh, some of the people in the Depression, I think it was a, uh, during the prohibition or so they got to boot like it, you know, making the uh, first well, what years is this in? Well, the, the, uh, during the depression. The, uh, Do you remember that very much about that boot making here in the city? Highway I mean, I went dry in the... Uh, now you mean went dry, you mean by what? Well, the prohibited any sale of liquor was yeah. on January 1st, 1916. 1915, all the saloons that were in Sioux City had to close. Didn't the whole nation go dry? Well, they all went dry, but not at the same time. Okay, and so what happened then? The, the saloons closed, and then uh, our saloon opened up as South Bank Bars, and then uh, the hard drinks were sold in Sioux City. Yeah, so what happened then? Well, they closed down. Was that expensive? Oh, yes. In the coffee pot, too? Yes. Yeah, they served us, they served us coffee, and it was everything uh, yeah. else. So how much was drinks back then? I suppose they were pretty expensive. Well, we didn't drink, so I, I don't know, but I had some relatives, they're nice people, too. 
Not in this city, but they, uh, they got into that game. Was that pretty expensive buying that booze back then then? No. Yeah. I think, uh, I think it was half a point. Most of it was sold in half points. So that, uh, it seemed to me that they said a half point could be bought for 50 cents. That was a lot of And we had, we had a distillery, a pretty well built distillery, right over on what is, uh, is West Third and West Way. Now, there was a big two story building there. And there was? There still is one there. Is that the old brewery they call that? No, no, this was right downtown. Mm -hmm. Right downtown. And we finally raided it, and we found one of the most modern stills. It was one under the name of Rose and Palm Transfer. That was their storage building. Well, in this storage building, we found a very modern, up-to-date still. And how many times did it pay for itself? Well, I don't know that. <laughs> that was it uh, a bank robbery and a murder? Yes, right in our own neighborhood. Across the street from it. Uh, in fact, uh, I know the fellow that uh, robbed one of the banks and that, uh, that killed one of his partners over the settlement. So what happened to him then? He was, uh, the third time, he got out. It was kind of a funny deal. They were squabbled over the dividing of the bank. And in fact, uh, Right in the house across the street from where they robbed the bank. Yes. Yeah. And in fact, uh, the bank was just uh, a neighborhood bank, and they locked the uh, cashier in the vault. Now, did the cashiers have guns sitting right up there by him? No. I was talking to a person that <coughs> was a farmer up by Galva, but he banked in Cherokee that said that when he went to the Steel State Bank in Cherokee to do business. The tellers used to have guns right up there by, the, by the tables when people come up to do banking business. I don't doubt that a bit. You never so heard that or you never? I've never seen it in some city itself. Not with First National Bank? No. Well, they had, a, they had an officer that was on the floor that uh, was armed, and all he did was walk around him. But we had bank robberies. Well, things was, was, hard, was hard. If you had a funeral, you couldn't pay for it. We didn't happen to have one, but uh, people had to have to bury the dead. Undertakers was another. It, it, people just, it's the cheapest term. So some were buried in Potter's Field. And I see since then, I've been out there, and uh, since the better times come, their relatives have put markers up for them. But the general directors really suffered too. First automobile. Well, I was trying to think. We didn't, we didn't get our automobile with our own tour. My goodness, uh, all the children were growing up. Oh, they only one in the seventh that was, could come and ask for the car. We didn't have one on the other floor. So what year would that have been then? Well, he graduated in, uh, in 57, about a few of them so uh, it was long in the 50s. My goodness, that was quite a few years. Now this family's running around with four and five cars. That's right. That's the right. prices of corn, the way prices are now, it's kind of changed to go back to the subject a little bit. Like the prices of corn are $1.50, $60 a bushel. Do you see another depression coming in with $2,000, $3,000 acre land? I can't see what to... Uh, you got any, any idea what could happen out of this? Uh, You've seen this once. Can it be coming yes. again? Oh, yes. It's possible. Because you can't pay for a $1,000 acre land with $2 corn. It's impossible. So this is what principally happened back during the Depression time. That That's right. Do you know how much land cost back then in Bell Charlie? Any uh, idea? Yes, to a certain extent. A $100 an acre was a good price for railroad land. Now, what, what year was that? Well, in the 20s. In the 20s. And then uh, when the Depression hit, you couldn't sell a farm for $60 an acre. 
There just was no market. Nobody had the $60. The banks were, banks were foreclosing all over, and they had the farm and farm and city property. I had someone tell me that the insurance companies are the ones to blame for a lot of this, too. Well, there was a lot of insurance money uh, furnished. The insurance money was furnished to the banks. Yeah.